but we will catch up. I'm going to go ahead and turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Matthew Garofalos um, and Dr. John Dell Jenkins, um, and we're going to get into more of the wound care at this point and uh, talk about wounds that do not heal. Thank you. Let me find out. What's going on. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the the previous presentations for the past hour and a half have been extremely enlightening in light of the fact I've been involved in outpatient surgical facilities for the past 20 years and um, so much so that I opened up a side business of consulting and billing for office-based uh, non-CON accredited surgical facilities. We opened about 20 of those facilities in the past 20 years. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting idea that I think is going to get legs and continue to keep going. Okay, let's go to wound care and now that everybody has had time to digest their breakfast, hopefully, we can talk about um, some wounds that just don't heal or won't heal or we have difficulty getting these to close. Some of these are, of course, like the two we have up on the screen now due to pressure, due to previous amputations, due to decreased blood flow. But what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tag team with uh, Dr. Jenkins here, I'm just going to put up a few pictures, talk about some scenarios as to why they would be problematic. And then Dr. Jenkins is going to get more into the didactic and the meats and potatoes of uh, what's going on with these wounds. Um, and this was one. This is a great one. Now, why doesn't this one heal? Well, it's, uh, this isn't a vascular condition. This is actually the, the patient demonstrating that he can hold his own foot and telling me that, yes, that's going to heal perfectly. Of course, this patient has some psychotic conditions. Um, and you can tell by the granulation tissue around the stump of his tibia at the top of the picture that um, he has good blood flow to that point. But actually, this is a very sad case where this patient was actually shackled to his bed by his mother. And um, when she burned the house down trying to kill him, the firemen rescued him. But his foot was already gone. Uh, but that's why this won't heal. It's already gone. This is a case that, um, unfortunately, we see all too often and immediately garners a consultation for vascular intervention because we know that there's a local ischemia present and that this will not heal without appropriate intervention. Hopefully, we can save the remainder part of the foot with vascular intervention, but in all likelihood, we'll probably have to do a transmetatarsal amputation or something like that. But many times, this is what presents in either our office or at, uh, in our clinic at the VA, and uh, this is just very unfortunate because it's gotten to this point. This is a great slide. This is um, courtesy of um, our friends in orthopedics who did a hip replacement on a patient and forgot to protect the heel in recovery when they sent this patient to rehab. And as a result, the heel was ulcerated. You can tell by the granulation tissue that um, th there's good blood flow here, but that's the Achilles tendon that's hanging out there that we have to go back and repair. Um, this will heal with proper intervention um, and a lot of debridement and probably a little bit of graft and probably takes about two or three procedures to get this to go ahead and heal. But again, this is something that we're faced with and we're told, uh-oh, too bad the hip was replaced, now we have to do a BK. Not so much. This is something that we can absolutely save. Pressure ulcers are something that we deal with all the time, and we wonder how they come about and why they don't heal, uh, especially in the diabetic patients. Whether or not they have good circulation, they're neuropathic. And, of course, these are problematic. Many patients don't even realize that they're here, and they present with, with why is my sock getting wet all the time? or something like that. And so they present with uh, this ulceration and perhaps all they need is maybe a little revascularization or a little cleanup procedure and a little offloading and these go on to heal very nicely. Of course, there's always the uh, surprise where the patient walks in and has a little callus on the bottom of their foot and I've had it here for two months and it just won't go away, I don't know why. Of course, they're diabetic, decreased blood flow, and uh, neuropathic, we go ahead and debride that callus to see what's going on, or when we press it, we find out, wow, there's a lot of cushioning underneath there. It's a little fluctuant. I wonder what's happening. 
And then you go ahead and debride this a bit and you get the surprise and you keep debriding and keep debriding and keep debriding and you go deeper and deeper. And of course, this is a patient that actually does have good flow, but is neuropathic. Of course, we all have to deal with osteomyelitis and until we clear the wound of the osteomyelitis, that wound is not going to heal. So this would be a reason why this wound probably won't heal because we're probing to bone. The forefoot has osteomyelitis, so uh, Grayson told us in 1995 that when you can probe to bone, there's a pretty good chance that the patient has osteomyelitis. There's been some studies since then to maybe not agree with that, but I think as a rule of thumb, this is what, uh, what I teach my residents, and better to go this route than to be more cautious than to be not cautious enough. So this is a wound that won't heal until we can clear the infection whether that be via surgical intervention or whether that be via IV antibiotics if the, if the vasculature will support something like that. Of course, venous stasis ulcers, which we've been talking about yesterday and today, um, there's a variety of reasons why these won't heal. Um, the one in the upper right especially looks kind of dark, ominous with that nice irregular border. Um, that actually needs some intervention before that's going to heal. All of these need quite a bit of vascular intervention before they're going to heal and quite a bit of debridement. So when these come in, they need more than just work that, that we can do as podiatric physicians to get these to heal. They need support up above. They need to be a little new piping or the piping cleaned out a bit. Of course, this is something that none of us can actually heal except via excision or excisional biopsy or even amputation. And we do see this, unfortunately, all too frequently, especially in the VA setting here in Chicago, where these patients come in late stage, malignant melanoma, and so we do the best that we can to support them with this. Um, the traditional heel ulcer, why won't this heal? Well, it's been present for a long time. Many of these patients come to us either from home care or, or nursing homes, and there's always been a controversy as to what do we do with this? Do we debride it? Do we not debride it? What do we do? Well, I think the way that we recommend to our residents and to our students is we don't debride this. We debride the edge just a little bit if there's adequate blood flow. If there's adequate flow, and of course the first place this patient's going to go is to the blood flow lab, and if there's adequate flow, we'll debride just the edge and uh, offload this, put on a, either iodosorb, Santil, something like that around the wound edge to slowly decrease the size of this Eschgar cap. Now remember, there's not a lot of tissue between this cap and the calcaneus, mostly fat, which isn't very vascular. So if we go ahead and take this off, the next layer of tissue will become Eschgar. The next layer after that is bone, and then we're talking osteomyelitis and infection. So with an Eschgar cap like this, this is going to take a long time to heal if there's adequate flow. But if when in the presence of adequate flow, this will do just fine with offloading and incremental debridement. And of course, a big old venous stasis ulcer that is going to need some intervention before we can close this. This, to get to this point already, the patient has undergone quite a bit of compression therapy, but because of the perforator beneath this ulcer, um, they're going to need some intervention to get that fixed before we can proceed. And I think uh, John Dell is going to take, the rest, take it the rest of the way here. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, talk long at all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Garofalos. And as I was telling Dr. Garofalos yesterday, uh, a patient never comes into your office to tell you that uh, they don't have a pulse. Uh, they usually show up to the office with a wound. Nobody ever knows uh, that my dorsalis pedis is not, I can't feel it today, doctor. No, you never hear anything like that. They show up with a wound. I'm just going to go through a couple of things. That I'm preaching to the choir, but I, and when you talk about wound care, you need to go through some of these uh, fundamentals or uh, you're a little bit uh, admissive, remissive. Um, principles of wound care, of course, the brimine necrotic tissue, the prevention, treatment of infection, uh, absorption of the exudate, protection, insulation. We all know this. Uh, when you have a wound, you have to get rid of the necrotic tissue uh, or you, the wound will not be able to um, heal. 
podiatrists have been a, a very, very influential and, and instrumental in dealing with diabetic wounds of the foot and ankle because they show up in our offices more than they show up. They, they'll actually have a wound in their foot, leave their primary care office, don't say anything about it, and now primary care are more in tune to ask to look at the feet, and they won't say anything about a wound in their foot until they get to the foot doctor and they take off their shoe and, you know, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of things that just present when you're, you know, not really expecting them. Um, this is impact of diabetes on wound healing. Uh, we all know these things, biomechanical changes, immune function, neuropathic, um, uh, tissue destruction, all of those. Um, and diabetes affects wound healing in all stages, stage one through four. Uh, we know the different stages of wound healing, but diabetes affects all of those. The underlying mechanisms of diabetes um, is the micro and macro circulation problems, which um, impede any kind of uh, uh, vasculature, which helps the wound to heal. Okay, all types of diabetic wounds are affected by um, uh, healing, poor healing. Surgical wounds, burns, foot ulcers, venous insufficiency, atypical wounds, which I think they're going to talk about on the venous side. Uh, blood glucose, glucose control is very, very important. Uh, people can hide from their fasting blood glucose level when they go to the medical doctor. They'll do everything they can when they know the doctor is going to check their blood glucose but they cannot hide from their A1C. And actually, I have seen a lot of patients recently with double-digit A1Cs, and they always say, well, doctor, I don't eat anything but chicken and fish, and they're over 300 pounds. Um, of course, peripheral arterial disease is associated with 62% of all non-healing foot ulcers. Depending on what journal you read, it's usually from anywhere from 60 to 70%, and it's a factor in 46% of all amputations. Uh, vascular disease in the lower extremity and ulcer formation, incidence of ischemia is four times greater in patients with diabetes. And uh, of course, the, the plaques that appear on the arteries, I have an x-ray that I hope uh, we can see the plaques. And when you see those plaques on the x-ray, then you know you're just treading water. Uh, wound healing in lower extremity, of course, is very dependent on vasculation, vascularity. Uh, the A1C, as I talked about, uh, there's a million dressings uh, out there for wound care. Now, they're always getting on doctors, but if you see some of these engineered, bioengineered tissue dressing, even some of these little pads are $400 a pad, and they got to change them every day, and they're talking about us uh, being too expensive. Uh, but there are a lot of different modalities out there for wound care. The wound care industry has just boomed because wound care is just so, so very, very prevalent these days. Now, this is a couple of things we all know. Um, there's a lot of patients that you have problems with, and um, sometimes the underlying cause is in, uh, vitamins and minerals. Uh, patients, some, some are obviously malnourished, and you're doing everything to try and heal that wound, but the bottom line is they have a vitamin deficiency and mineral deficiency. Sometimes it's good to run a vitamin screen on your patients, and as you'll be alarmed at some of the things that you might see. Uh, I have patients that come in the office that have potato chips hidden in their um, purse and cigarettes hidden in their pocket, and they'll tell you that they don't smoke and they don't eat junk food. Okay, how much do you supplement? The general rule, use the USDA. Um, avoid those megadose vitamins. But a vitamin screen on your patients with uh, chronic wounds is always a good thing to do. Vitamin A is one of the main deficiencies that uh, can impede a lot of um, uh, wound healing because it takes care of the microphage and the monocyte and the fibronectin and the cellular adhesion. These are things we learned in uh, college, but we still need to uh, remember them sometimes, and it increases the inflammatory response in wounds. All of this is vitamin A, so you need to, you, it's the, the take-home message of this whole thing is you have to assess the total patient when you're trying to get the wound to heal. You have to know how about their vitamin A, their vitamin C, and the deficiencies they have. Vitamin E is another one. Well, just do a vitamin screen and you'll be surprised at what you might find. And some of the trace elements, I, just, I won't go through this. Uh, zinc is a very important one that we learn about in wound care and um, zinc deficiencies uh, that usually from chronic alcoholism, somebody who's had a surgical trauma, 
somebody has a lot of psoriasis, and somebody has gastrointestinal problems, they usually have zinc deficiencies, and I've noticed it a lot in end-stage renal disease patients. Okay, I just wanted to show you. This here is a man with a double-digit A1C. It was like 14. Uh, his wound did go on the heel. He had several vascular procedures. I think Dr. Gozar did them over at Trinity, but he did go on to heal, and he uh, healed nicely because he was in the uh, midfoot area, and we did aggressive wound care. We did the wound vac. We did uh, aplograph. We did everything uh, known to man on him, and he did heal. This young man here, you're fighting with the skin. If you notice the skin on the top, that's why I took a picture of the top of his foot and the bottom of his foot, and he's already, I think, is he missing a toe on that foot? No. Uh, uh, he works for the city, and we were able to get him healed after a vascular uh, procedure along with an uh, offloading procedure. I think we took out the head of the uh, metatarsal. Here it is. And after we took out the head of the metatarsal, he went on to heal. Now, this young man here, this is uh, Dr. Jones at Mercy. Uh, we could not, once you get a uh, problem in the digits, uh, it is hard to get the digit to heal because you can get circulation to the foot, but for, it is hard to get the circulation to the digits, especially in a smoker or in somebody who is a diabetic, has a diabetic and they have the microcirculation problems. Uh, unfortunately, this man went on to uh, BKA, and uh, uh, sometimes you have to tell your patients uh, that they would have a uh, better quality of life. Now this young lady here, this, is, this lady, I yell at her all the time. She is a one and a half to two pack a day smoker. She will not stop smoking. She's only 58, I think, years old. Uh, she's had uh, several um, uh, vascular procedures done. She even asked me to just amputate all her toes so she can continue smoking. And I refused to do it. She went and asked Dr. Jones if he would do it at Mercy, and he said no. So she's just sitting up suffering with uh, this. And, but she, and she won't quit smoking. And this is a young lady here that, um, as, as I was saying, she has all kinds of uh, deficiencies as far as vitamin deficiencies. And it's just harder and harder to heal her. When we got all the way down from this first picture on the um, left, to the uh, uh, granular tissue, good granular tissue, and it's, it's just very, very slow, but if you look closely, you can see the cuboid, and um, as I think I was telling Dr. Garofalos earlier, uh, she came in our office the other day, and we're working aggressively on this wound, and I didn't get a chance ever to see her other foot, and I said, well, let me look at your other foot. So she reluctantly took the shoe off, and her big toe on the other foot is black. But this is uh, just an... Uh, a sheet they give them at the wound care center that tells them how they're, how they're doing with their phosphorus and their calcium. And this is a very important sheet for the patient to have so the patient could actually keep up with um, their own. This is the same patient on the uh, other foot. I don't know whether you can see it, but if you look closely on the x-ray in between the metatarsals, you can see the uh, calcified vessels going in between the metatarsals. And whenever you see the vessels are calcified, then you know you're just treading water. And this is my puppy. He has a heart condition. <laughs> so every morning I get up and I have to give him enalapril and furosemide. He's 13, so hopefully next year I can still show you his picture. Thank you. If I can also get Dr. Sukas to come up on our panel, we're going to be uh, starting the live case in just a little bit, and oh, if I could have okay. you stay on the panel as well. Um, Dr. Chamberlain, if Dr. Chamberlain's here, if you could come on the panel. Oh, thank you so much, John. Yeah, you want to go ahead and uh, go ahead and, no, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, you can go ahead and do it definitive. Yeah. Let me get the slides up here oh, just a second. <clears throat> this is going to be the definitive early talk. And please reset the timer. All righty, thanks. So uh, my name is Syed Hussein. I'm a vascular surgeon in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about the uh, definitive LE data 
And um, the first question I had is, how many of you in this room are familiar with this data at all? Okay. All right, good. All of you are atherectomy users, I assume? Most, most okay. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to thank Jaffer for Goldzar for inviting me to speak on this topic today. Um, I'm going to just give a quick overview of this trial, so obviously if there's any questions, we can address them at the end of the uh, discussion. So essentially, as we all know in this room, vascular disease is a, is a progressive problem, um, and we don't have a cure for this problem. So the main thing that when we look at vascular, vascular disease, especially in the lower extremities, we're looking at these patients consistently returning to us for further therapy. Um, the goal, of course, is to try to not maximize their therapy the first time you see these patients. The goal is to try to maximize their ability to, to get over their current symptoms. And we all know that at some point these patients will go ahead and come back, and you want to make sure you have options to be able to treat these patients down the line. What you're seeing on the screen is essentially just a continuum of the problem that we seem to encounter on a regular basis. And the question is, which way do you go when you see these patients? Of course, the first thing is prevention and medical management to make sure these patients' overall risk factors are well managed. But once you have them in the cath lab, the question is, well, which way do you go with these patients, whether you uh, go right to surgery or you treat them with an angioplasty balloon catheter, an atherectomy device, a stent, et cetera, things of that sort. The study design essentially for the definitive trial was the largest trial that's been done on an atherectomy device. Uh, it was to evaluate the long-term effectiveness of the TurboHawk atherectomy system. Um, involved in treating uh, both femoral palpiteal disease and patients with below knee uh, um, uh, tibial and peroneal disease as well. Just to give you an oversight of the details, it involved uh, patients with both diabetic and non-diabetic populations. It was a prospective non-randomized study, um, 800 patients at 47 centers. It was aggressively screened by the Clinical Events Committee as well as an uh, oversight committee uh, for the core lab and um, involved about duplex and angiographic evaluation. These are the eligibility criteria. Uh, the key thing to remember for exclusion criteria was anybody who had instant restenosis or vessels that had aneurysmal components to them or had severe calcification were considered to be excluded from this trial. The inclusion criteria listed right there involving all the Rutherford classes with greater than 50% stenosis, lesion lengths of at least uh, 20 centimeters or less, and a refer reference vessel diameter of about 1.5 millimeters to less than seven millimeters. The design essentially involved 800 patients total at 47 centers. Um, there were 598 claudication patients know. and 201 CLI patients with Rutherford class four to class six. The patency was assessed at 12 months by duplex for the claudicant arm and freedom from major unplanned amputation for patients in the CLI arm. Okay. All right. There was also a pre-specified non-inferiority analysis for right. diabetics versus non-diabetics. As all of you are aware, when we do any type of interventions, both surgical or, or endovascular, patients with diabetics, diabetic patients tend to have worse outcomes as opposed to non-diabetic patients. When they looked at claudicant patients, they divided them into these two populations. You can see there's 280 patients in the diabetic arm and 318 patients in the non-diabetic arm. And again, the primary patency was evaluated at 12 months. This is the baseline demographics, a pretty standard for vascular patients. What you do see in the CLI arm, however, is they do have a higher incidence of diabetes, and they did have a higher incidence of renal insufficiency, both of which are high risk uh, for below knee vascular disease. The Rutherford breakdown demonstrated right here for the claudicant arm is Rutherford class three was essentially the most common uh, class for patients in the claudicant arm as opposed to Rutherford class five in the CLI arm, which is indicative of minor tissue loss on most of these patients. When you looked at the number of patients from the core lab standpoint, you can see there are 598 in the claudication arm, 201 in the CLI arm for a total of 799 patients. You the breakdown of the lesions, 743 in the claudication arm, 279 in the CLI arm, uh, with a total of 1,022 lesions. Mean lesion length was right around seven centimeters. Uh, baseline stenosis was within the 75% range. And occlusions, if you can see by the breakdown of claudication versus uh, CLI patients, most of your CLI patients uh, appeared to have occlusions uh, that they were being dealt with. Anatomical location breakdown, you can see uh, for claudication, mostly was the femoral popliteal segment involving the SFA. Uh, when you went into CLR arm, you saw a higher incidence of infrapopliteal disease uh, as well compared to the claudication arm. 
when outcomes are looked at, it's, it's uh, always interesting when, what the investigator reports and what the core lab sees as being a true success rate. Uh, when we talked about device success being less than 30% residual stenosis after the directional atherectomy, you see there's an 87% success rate reported by the investigator, about 76% by the core lab, which has obviously different criteria when they look at um, what percent of stenosis has been left behind. So most core labs, when they look at the success rate of the therapy, they usually like to see 20% residual disease on either end of the segment that was treated to be considered a successful uh, therapy. For as far as pre dilatation was concerned, about 9% of patients had a pre dilatation for directional atherectomy, uh, of which about 33% uh, of those patients had a post, uh, a post PTA after the directional atherectomy was done. So about a third of the patients had some type of uh, PTA done at low atmospheric pressures. As you can see, the mean pressure was 6.6 .6 atmospheres in this case, and only 3% of the patients out of 800 essentially had a bailout stem procedure done uh, after the atherectomy was performed. This is the complications that involves all the subjects. You can see distal embolization rates were 3.8% total in this case, of which only 0.1% uh, required a surgical intervention and 1.5% of which 12 patients required an endovascular intervention. Dissection was similarly uh, low in this case as well, as well as perforation. Um, the endovascular interventions for perforation were the highest at 4% for a total overall intervention rate in the trial of 7.6%. This is the walking impairment question in a Rutherford class evaluation at 30 days and 12 months, and you can see that there was a significant improvement in Rutherford class after the therapy had been performed, and that seemed to sustain itself at one year as well. Um, and you can see from the walking impairment questionnaire, patients definitely had a significant improvement in their ability uh, to deal with pain and walking distance. So what about patients for, uh, who are diabetics and non-diabetics and then for Clodicans? Well, when you look at um, Clodican cohort, there were 743 lesions total that were treated in this Clodican arm, mean lesion length being about 7.5% with a mean baseline stenosis of about 70%. And what you see is that when you look at the PSVR on your duplex of less than 3.5, the patency is right at about 82%. When we look at what most studies uh, look at and are published in the literature currently, they use a baseline characteristic of 2.4 uh, for a PSVR velocity, and you're looking at about a 78% patency in one year for all clodican, uh, the clodican arm in this particular trial. When you looked at the uh, diabetic and non-diabetic uh, patients, you can see there was a significant patency was not, was not significantly different between the two. Diabetics was 77%, non-diabetics was 78%, sort of almost challenging the literature, uh, showing that there isn't a significant difference in the outcomes between the two different patient populations. And you can see that the lesion lengths treated were essentially the same uh, in both arms. What about when we look at stenosis versus occlusions? Well, stenosis patients, the patency with a less than 2.4 duplex criteria shows about an 81% patency as opposed to occlusions, which often tend to have a lower patency uh, with uh, any type of endovascular intervention, showed a 64% patency. This is for a total patency of 78% for the entire arm. The lesions in the occlusion arm were also longer lesions as opposed to the uh, stenosis lesions. Again, longer lesions with occlusions tend to have less patency rates as compared to patients who have stenosis and shorter lesions. When you look at it by length, once again, it, it pretty much goes standard to what literature shows uh, and has already been published. Uh, longer lesions tend to have uh, worse in patency. You can see lesions greater than 10 centimeters had a 67% patency as opposed to less than 4 centimeters and less than 10 centimeters, more or less, at about 83%. When we looked at the blood vessels and, and seeing if that has an influence on the overall outcomes, you can see that, again, the, even though the infrapopital segment tends to have lower patency rates, in this particular trial, they had a better patency at one year, purely because, uh, of, because of the lesion characteristics, perhaps, or even because the lesions were probably shorter in length. When you look at the mean lesion length treated in each arm, you can see, you can see a lesion length of 8.1 centimeters in the SFA, and with the infrapopital segment, it was about a 5 centimeter lesion. So def definitely a significant difference in the lesion length. What about task classification? Uh, the trial was broken down to look at the task classification as well, and you can see the task C uh, had a 72% patency rate at one year with a lesion length of 16.5 centimeters, obviously lowering lesion lengths being in the higher task uh, categories. But again, it was definitely comparable to the other two classes. New lesions versus restenotic lesions. Restenotic lesions had a slightly lower patency rate versus de novo lesions, but not significantly different. Lesion lengths were essentially the same between the two groups, but you can see that the 78% patency for de novo lesions as opposed to 73% for stenotic or restenotic lesions. 
So when you look at a graph here, you look at all the different trials that have been done, both on PTA and on bare metal stenting, and looking at uh, atherectomy trials, you can see the atherectomy seems to fit right in with all of those trials, but it's still giving you the opportunity to continue to treat those patients when those restenotic lesions tend to reappear. What about for CLI patients? Well, again, the key thing to look at in CLI is limb salvage and not the patency. Uh, overall, limb salvage rate free from amputation at 12 months was 95% in this particular trial. You can see that goes along very well with all the other major trials that have been published um, regarding limb salvage, especially most of the uh, uh, bypass arms. When you look at basal bypass arm and you look at the heparin coated graft uh, that was uh, done by Pulley out in Italy uh, to look at the outcomes for limb salvage in that particular case, you can see that uh, this was just in line and, in fact, much better than most of those trials. 279 lesions with an average length of 7.2 centimeters, 76% mean baseline stenosis, demonstrating a 71% patency at one year on duplex study with a PSVR of less than 2.4. When you look at it by vessels, you can see again 66% patency uh, with the PSVR less than 2.4 in patients with CLI. Uh, there were 48 patients in the popliteal arm uh, that had the best outcomes, but again, the key thing to look at is the lesion length. It was 5.4 centimeters as opposed to 8.6 centimeters in the SFA, which will definitely influence the overall patency rate. So in conclusion, this is the largest trial to date that's been published on atherectomy, uh, 800 patients, uh, probably the most intensely studied and, of course, uh, very scrutinized by the CEC and the Coral Lab. And, of course, the nice uh, conclusions to draw from this are the fact that not only was this the largest trial, but also it was broken down very nicely to look at diabetics and non-diabetics, to look at task classifications, and to look at it by vessel to see where this therapy appears to work the best. Um, probably the take home message from this is to look at the 83% patency rates in the SFA for lesions less than 10 centimeters, a 78% patency rate uh, for infrapopliteal lesions that are right around 6 centimeters or so, and a 95% limb salvage rate, which is really what we're all trying to solve in these patients when they come in with uh, non healing wounds. Um, distal embolization was quite low, and the overall interventional rate for complications was about 7.6%, uh, which is definitely uh, relatively safe when it comes to this particular type of therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fain. Don't escape yet. All right, there you go. Dr. Miller, if I could have you on the panel as well, please. We're going to go ahead and go live to um, Good Samaritan Hospital with Dr. Amir Matarjame. Um, he's going to be performing a live case. Amir, can you hear me? You're going with that camera? Yes. Wonderful. All right, you're live. Um, we have you on the screen. We have audio. So if you'd like to present your case for us. Okay, Jeff. Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, the case, the, our first case today is a 55-year-old uh, gentleman who is complaining of intermittent claudication of the uh, left leg for the past few months. Uh, he has no comorbidity okay, except a history of smoking for 40 years. Uh, he claims that he stopped a month ago. Uh, but anyhow, uh, on physical examination, his carotid arteries were okay. His aorta was not aneurysmal. Femoral pulses were palpable. On the right side, he is uh, pedal pulses are palpable. On the left side, are absent. His ABI on the <coughs> left side was 0 0.50. Uh, we uh, did a diagnostic angio on him. Uh, are we seeing that aortogram <coughs> now? Okay, can you see the angios? Uh, not yet. Jaffa? No, I can't see it yet. You don't? So we're going to... Are we showing the angios? Let's go ahead and show the angio if we can. Well, go show the monitor, please. <coughs> Well, anyhow, his uh, aortogram. Uh, okay. 
this is a system is not really up to par, but anyhow, do you see it now? Yes, we see it now, yes. Jaffa? Yeah, we see it. Okay. Uh, show me the, uh, the next one. Okay, then the next, Angio. Okay, that's his uh, Ilya Gorderis. Yeah, keep showing that. Uh, nothing significant. Next one. There we go. Now we have the angiograms up. Uh, look at his uh, runoff. He has total occlusion, flash occlusion of the uh, left superficial femoral artery. The right one looks okay. Next. This is his runoff reconstitution in adductor canal. Uh, next one. Uh, some stenosis of the popliteal artery. Next one. Left side is okay. Uh, right side is okay. And this will run off all, all right. Now. Here we have a, a gentleman who has uh, a total occlusion of SFA from origin all the way down to uh, a doctor canal. Uh, the question is, number one, is this patient a right patient for endovascular technique or for surgical bypass graft? Uh, now, I'd like to see what the panel thinks about this type of the SFA occlusion. Amir, before I turn it over to the panel, I have a quick question. Uh, we missed the initial part of the angiogram. Uh, was there a stump on the uh, SFA, or was it a flesh occlusion? Uh, it was flesh occlusion, and I'll find a black view and show it to you. Uh, no, it was flesh occlusion. Dr. Sukas, what do you think? Would, the, would this uh, be a percutaneous? Or? Like position. Yeah, I, I certainly think this would be a reasonable case to do uh, percutaneously. Uh, given the length of the lesion, um, uh, if, if you can successfully traverse the occlusion uh, with excellent runoff and good sized vessels, I think this would actually be a, uh, an ideal case to do with a stent graft. Dr. Miller, what do you think? That must be Peter. <laughs> Peter. Good morning, Amir. How old did you Good say morning. the patient was? Okay. Amir, how old was the patient? Dr. Miller is on panel as well. Uh, 55 years old. Yeah. Uh, this is his uh, oblique view. So Can you show that? It's showing. Oh, it's showing. Okay. You see the oblique view, and it, it looks like it's a flush occlusion. Yes, it does. Okay. It also looks like there's some stenosis at the origin of the profunda, so that'll need to be uh, of the protected profunda, or evaluated. Exactly. Yep. That's how so I'm, I'm going to ask our surgeon on the panel, Dr. Hussain is here as well. So Dr. Hussain, what do you think about this? I know you do a lot of endo work, but you're a vascular surgeon, so it's nice to get your input about a lesion like this. I think, I think in this case, you know, with the being, uh, I think he has a block clot occasion, I think what Amir said earlier. I think an endovascular option is a very good option to start off the first time around um, if you can get across it. The key, however, is to make sure that we don't lose, um, we don't damage the distal popliteal artery, the above knee popliteal artery, because obviously you want to always be able to make sure you have your bypass options open down the line. Um, as far as that profunda is concerned, I, that is one thing that you have to be worried about in this case, that if you decide to stent, that we don't cover the origin of that profunda, which in this case is can be easily done if you don't have a very good oblique view. You know, so you'd almost have to figure out what you're going to do with that proximal end once you get across it. You know, Jaffer, uh, with, a, with a difficult ostium like this, sometimes uh, we will, assuming that we successfully traverse the occlusion, 
This would actually be a case where I would also consider a little bit of directional uh, atherectomy. Show me the uh, for the osteum, and again, if your like view shows SFA. that there's disease in the profunda, potentially, potentially that could be treated at the same time. Uh, another scenario where we'll sometimes do directional atherectomy for the first 14. couple of centimeters is if 14. the patient has a high bifurcation, uh, where the common femoral divides. Uh, over the middle of the femoral head or, or even close to the inguinal ligament. And in that situation, it's, it's nice to be able to do some directional atherectomy to sort of redefine the anatomy and optimize the visualization of the lesion. I completely agree. What do you think, Amira? So are you going to proceed here, obviously? Uh, no, I'm going to ask the panel, uh, are you, uh, if you look at the right SFA, do you give any consideration that right SFA looks so nicely normal? We know that in peripheral arteries, we have a mirror image. For every stenosis you have on one side, you get another one on the other side, maybe a lot less, maybe a lot more, but usually 95% of the cases there are mirror image. Now, mm -hmm. your right SFA is, looks so normal. Do you give any consideration for that? Well, I mean, it could be that we have a, a very focal stenosis um, in the left SFA um, that occluded and the rest of, uh, of the CTO that we see there is pretty much thrombus. Uh, but it is unusual to have that, you're right, but I mean, it is something that is not unlikely. It's something that we definitely see. It is unusual, however. What do you guys think? It's a little unusual, but uh, you know, oftentimes, with these, oftentimes with these flush occlusions, if you, if you get a little bit creative and extreme with your angulation, you'll oftentimes be able to see a little nipple or a little remnant of, of where the true ostium used to be. Uh, another potential technique is to uh, uh, evaluate that with external ultrasound and oftentimes that can tell you sort of where the where, where the actual ostium of the SFA comes off. Nelson Bernardo has done a very nice job sort of illuminating and expounding on that technique and if it truly is a flush occlusion um, you do also have the option of course of, of trying to approach it retrograde from either a pedal or a popliteal access. Okay let me uh uh, can you show me that the uh, angel from yesterday? Uh, but, you know, with all respect to uh, all of you, uh, I have a little bit different approach, different opinion. Uh, I have never seen diffusely diseased SFA on one side and perfectly normal uh, almost perfectly normal artery on the other side. Uh, show me that number four. Now, if you zero down on, unfortunately, this, can you put the bone back on this? Uh, if you zero down on runoff, and you see some calcification there, and my feeling is that, or my feeling was, that he had some problems, some maybe severe stenosis at that point. Uh, as you see on the other side, there is some narrowing in that area as well. And as Jaffar said, maybe that was the reason for the rest of the artery uh, get thrombosed. Uh, we see that not uncommonly. And the old days that we didn't have all these nice equipment, we always treated the patient that way. If we didn't get the entire artery open, but at least we got a big, big help from that. With that having in mind, uh, I did this angiogram yesterday. And can you show me that oblique view of the groin? And I decided to put this patient on TPA. Unfortunately, we don't have 
urocanase that usually works on chronic occlusion very nicely. Uh, go to next, uh, to next one. And here it is. I put a coaxial infusion catheter system there and put a sauce wire very slightly. The, the cap was very hard. It, was, it, took, a, uh, it took a few minutes to uh, penetrate that, and that's all I needed to park these uh, coaxial catheter in. And I put them on uh, TPA. I gave them one milligram per hour between the two ports. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, they called me that they think that this patient is having slight hematoma of the right groin at the puncture site. So I stopped his uh, uh, TPA because I thought uh, we might be able to go and uh, do a mechanical recanalization. And uh, can you show me the angio, first angio from today? So we came in today, and uh, uh, this is the, uh, the very first one, please. When we injected, I didn't, say, didn't see anything and uh, was uh, slightly uh, uh, disappointed. Uh, here is the angiogram. And uh, we're not and, seeing the angiogram on the screen. See, there it is. Uh, with, uh, you don't? Yeah, we, 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 we got it now. now. We got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, show me the angio from no. today. Okay. That's from today. And uh, show me the next one. And, and uh, okay. Keep going forward. Let's look at your directory. Okay, let me... Let's look at number six. Now, as I black the patient, keep going with that, Angel, forward it. See, there was clot lysis, and I'm uh, sure that if we would have continued this all the way to this morning, uh, we, we would have had much longer segment of uh, declotting. So we very gently, I put a 014 wire through that sauce wire. It went in without any fighting, and we did a uh, Ivis to look at it and see what's going on. Can we show that Ivis now? From beginning? Yeah. Okay, run it. Uh, this is coming right into uh, SFA. Can you see it, Jafar? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so obviously you've uh, lost. as you see, we go through these SFA. In the proximal SFA, we really don't see much. As we go forward, it looks like we have residual thrombus there, but the really artery itself doesn't look that bad. That's pretty incredible what that looks like. You know, uh, I think I've talked to you about this, Amir, as you know, I had taken some of your guidance on your work back in the 80s and 90s with thrombolytics and kind of put a 2013 twist on it, where instead of dripping thrombolytics overnight, we use power pulse and let it, uh, you know, marinate for about 20 minutes and come back and angiojet that and get uh, similar results with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. If your blood clot is fresh, if, if it is not, and a few months old, you really don't get that great result. But if it is fresh, 
you, oh, we do that. We do with, that with vibe on stent graft when it gets thrombosed. Well, actually, we do the I'm anti jet and we yeah. clean them up. No, I've actually done chronic occlusions that are several years old that have been known for, you know, have been previous surgeons have, haven't done them and, uh, or if they've had fa f uh, previously failed fem pops. And we have done uh, cases that are definitely um, over a year old. They uh -huh. do very well. But anyhow, we, uh, we sort of find this artery very clean until they get down to that adductor canal where I showed you the calcification. The main disease is right there. And it, we're just about getting there. Now, Amir, uh, how are you able to tell how so much of this really is thrombus and how much of this is plaque? What about the IVIS uh, uh, helps you determine the... Well, uh, plaque is, 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 is considerably denser, you know, on in, in, in IVIS. We will get to the plaque and you will see the difference, you know. And, uh, so with some of this mild residual so thrombus... So if you look at the... With some of this mild residual thrombus, uh, do you do anything with that or just treat the underlying lesion in the patient's yes. own thrombolytic? We, we, we have, yeah, we, we have angiojet ready, and uh, as soon as we finish watching this uh, uh, IVUS, we're going to run an angiojet just to make sure that if there are any residual clots there, we get rid of them because when you open your uh, distal cap, you may end up with uh, 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 some emboli. So we'll, we'll do the NG jet, and then we'll try to cross that. It might not be very easy to go through that very distal uh, occlusion uh, because it probably is bad enough, hard enough, that made the entire uh, artery to go down. And as you see, we're getting gradually down there. So one of the, you know, uh, the conundrums that we have is, you know, a lot, not a lot of people do thrombolytic therapy as, as you do uh, to see the underlying lesion. So you probably see that this is going to be a very focal lesion, uh, but, um, you know, someone else may just cross that and Here lay, lay 300 millimeters of stent. So is it prudent to put in 300 millimeters of stent for a 20 millimeter stenosis that's thrombosed? Well, that's the whole idea, right? Uh, that this will help you to save the artery. This is where the problem is. Mm -hmm. You see that? And the rest of them is okay. Now, what we got here is no angio, please. Well, we're going to push this. This is where the occlusion is. And we're going to run the NG jet from here. Go ahead. So this is a large, the Very larger NG jet, obviously. We'll, yeah, that's 120. And what kind of wire is that that you have? Is that 014 or 018? Uh, 014. Uh, this is through a pad by um, Boston Scientific. You can definitely see some of that calcium there, the calcium shadows. They ride That's our working canal. horse. I will uh, magnify that, then I'll show it to you, that you see there is calcification there. As you saw it on Ivis, that's actually the limit of the disease. Mm -hmm. is, uh, Does uh, any of our panel um, ever use this kind of technique frequently or ever at all? Yeah, I think a lot of it really depends on the clinical history. 
So if you see a situation like as Amir commented where the other side looks pristine and then you've got this, this uh, disparity on the other side, particularly if the patient has a history of atrial fibrillation, maybe hasn't been too terribly compliant with their anticoagulation, and particularly if the history is, is that of a, a modest claudication that suddenly becomes uh, abruptly worse, then I think you have to surmise that you may have uh, a pathophysiology as we're seeing here. Uh, one other uh, sign of recent occlusion was lack of large collateral arteries. Mm. Uh, you have to always uh, give it a consideration when you see a, uh, arterial occlusion with no significant uh, uh, collateralization that is indic indicative of uh, a recent occlusion. So let's say, I'm just going to ask the panel know, again, if, if they weren't using this technique, let's say you wanted to cross that osteal SFA CTO. Dr. Miller, how would, what would be your thought process in, uh, on how you would cross it? Would you use a glide wire? You would use a Vions? What uh, a crossing tool? Or how, how would you cross that? When there's uh, no stump visible, I'll usually use a angled glide catheter combined with a either straight or, or uh, angled glide wire. And uh, then once you perforate the proximal cap, put this on if 14. You need to prolapse, go ahead and prolapse. Uh, that that uh, angle on the glide catheter really helps you catch on what uh, stump there may be that mm -hmm. you're not uh, seeing very well. This you know, type of uh, asymmetric disease with principal thrombus as the uh, pathology, you know, ought to raise the the question of whether there's embolic uh, or paradoxical embolization or embolization from the heart from atrial fibrillation, as Peter said, so it may not apply in this situation. It looks like it's a pre-existing tight calcified yeah. stenosis that thrombosed retrograde, but if mm -hmm. you didn't have that, you would want to check uh, with a bubble study. Well, anyhow, this is, as you see, the calcification there. Mm -hmm. and uh, really, uh, when you have a flush occlusion of the uh, superficial femoral artery, it's really easier than most of the pe people think to get into the SFA. Uh, remember this, SFA is continuation of the common femoral artery. Deep femoral artery is the one goes posteriorly, but SFA is almost always strain line from common femoral artery. If you put a straight cat there, like a quick cross uh, or cross cat by Cook, and with a glide wire inside, just to make it a little bit body, and you just advance that, it will hit the, the cap on uh, SFA. And as we did with this one, all, all I did, I put the cat there, there, and I tap a little bit, you know, back and forth until the uh, the tip of the wire went in, and I advanced my catheter and put the sauce wire, and that was the end of it. So getting into superficial femoral artery when you have a flash occlusion is not really that difficult. Amir, what would you uh, think anyhow, about using uh, a, um, a laser in this situation as well as a thrombectomy device and, uh, as well as an atherectomy device? Well, that's one of our options after even for getting through this occlusion, a nine millimeter laser is, is something that we have used uh, on several occasions. I think it was last year or year before uh, I did it's a live case for you. And uh, yeah, and I used the laser 0.9 to go uh, uh, through the occlusion. It was something like this, but it was. Uh, a longer uh, occlusion. Here is the, you see, we still have maybe a little bit clot here, and uh, okay, let me have your glide wire. We're going to use a glide wire, it looks like a little bit uh, a dissection there, try to avoid that. 
the it, jet stream also uh, is a good tool for mm -hmm. a thrombotic occlusion like this. And one, uh, when Dr. Shimshak was talking yesterday, one mechanism that I've seen that he didn't mention for getting a bigger lumen than the size of the device is that you'll often see it as it goes through a basically normal vessel that's filled with clot, it'll be shimmying from yeah. side to side, and so it's slapping off the walls of the normal vessel and, and cleaning up everything in a circumferential manner. But it is remarkable how you can see now with the absence of clot, it really reveals the underlying lesion. So you said, Amir, you said you have a 035 glide wire here? Correct. What anticoagulation okay. are you We're using? We're going to do one injection from above to see our runoff. Amir, question was, what anticoagulation are you using from one of our panel members? A patient is on heparin right now. We tried to keep his uh, ACT uh, 250 plus. And uh, so you see we're right about there next to that calcification. And uh, here we go. There you go. And I'm going to, as soon as I get down there, put a distal protection device. Uh, I use uh, EV3's uh, Distal protection. Remember, we had a uh, stenosis here too. And we'll just check the runoff. Make sure everything is okay. So, Amir, what's going to be your next step here after you put your filter in? I'm, I'm putting the distal protection. Then I'm going to do a thorectomy and a dilatation, then I'll decide if I need a short stent or not. Okay. What we're going to do, Amir, we're going to uh, break away from you for uh, about 10 minutes. We're going to um, proceed with Dr. Okay. Sukas's talk, and then we'll join you back in about 10, 12 minutes. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'll see you. Can I have my slides up, please? Almost ready. You know, the technique that I was referring to earlier uh, with the power pulse, we have used in it about, um, about 12 to 15 patients over the past year, and we're going to be publishing that data pretty soon. But uh, really, uh, it was from Dr. Matarjame's uh, pioneering efforts back in the early 80s when this is exactly what he used to do, is drip thrombolytics in these long SFA CTOs. And, um, then it would truly just reveal a focal lesion, and then you can treat that focal lesion uh, with a very targeted approach instead of laying, you know, 300 millimeters of a stent or, or, or uh, damaging the uh, intima with, uh, a, you know, a balloon angioplasty, and, and which may increase your restenosis rates. Okay. Uh, uh, Jaffer, thanks uh, very much again for inviting me uh, to this excellent meeting. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, patency of stent grafts compared with uh, Baird night and all stents and focusing on some recent uh, level one evidence-based medicine with regards to the uh, Viastar trial. Uh, these are my disclosures. Well, uh, as we've seen in the conference so far, there are a whole host of wonderful new uh, toys or devices that we can use to treat patients with long SFA disease. 
And um, we heard uh, from our last speaker about the definitive LE, and I think he made, eloquently made the point that for short to midterm lesions, uh, atherectomy is an excellent uh, modality for treating SFA disease. But as we can see, once we get into the longer lesions, particularly those that are more than 10 centimeters, our primary patency do, rates uh, do tend to drop off a bit. Uh, it was just discussion about laser atherectomy. Uh, laser is actually a wonderful way of uh, debulking these long, diffuse lesions. And the uh, Cello study was, uh, was published um, uh, a couple of years ago. And even though you can get very nice debulking uh, with laser, unfortunately, if we look at the primary patency rates at about a year, you can see that they're uh, somewhat disappointing at about uh, 53%. So, uh, like it or not, uh, Baird Knight and Allstents have really sort of risen to the fore of treatment for patients with longer SFA disease. And if we look at these uh, randomized trials that I have listed on this slide, it's pretty evident that for, uh, for SFA disease, uh, stenting certainly is superior to just plain old balloon angioplasty, but I would caution you to take these data in perspective, remembering that in every single one of the studies on this slide, the average lesion length was less than 10 centimeters. If we look at some uh, more recent data looking at longer lesion lengths, I think this is a better reflection of what we see in our day-to-day -day clinical practices, uh, namely that as lesion lengths go up, uh, pe primary patency rates go down, and then the other disturbing trend, of course, is that there's a higher uh, likelihood of developing stent fracture. Uh, obviously, we'll be uh, talking about the, the uh, VIPER trial uh, in a little bit more greater uh, detail in a couple minutes. Uh, the other stent uh, that has uh, been used, uh, particularly uh, in Europe from the Leipzig group, is the uh, woven nitinol uh, super stent. But you can see that, again, as you get into these longer lesion lengths, there's a drop off from 81% down to about 68% uh, at 24 months uh, with this uh, baronitinol stent. It was hoped, of course, that the Zilver PTX would be the magic bullet and the, the cure for restenosis. And certainly, uh, the data shows in the randomized trial a significant reduction in restenosis by more than 50%. Uh, but <clears throat> in these longer lesions in the SFA, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, Zilver registry arm, where the average lesion length was 224 millimeters, we saw a very good, but certainly not um, uh, out of the park home run, with a 77% primary patency. Drug-coated balloons, of course, we are all lustily and eagerly waiting for them to arrive on our shores. Um, and no doubt they've really revolutionized the treatment of peripheral disease in Europe. But I think we have to be honest and say that as wonderful as drug-coated balloons are, we have to question how terribly relevant they're gonna be in our day-to-day -day practices for these longer SFA lesions. Certainly, we see a significant reduction in late lumen loss, but uh, again, the primary patency rates uh, are good, but these were mean lesion lengths of only about seven or eight centimeters. Now, this, I think, is really a more realistic expectation of what uh, we hope to achieve with drug-coated balloons in the SFA. This was a, a nice paper from Andre Schmidt's group in Leipzig uh, that they presented at the link meeting. And you can see that with an average uh, 24 centimeter lesion length, they had a very respectable 77% uh, primary patency rate. But it's important to remember that nearly a quarter of those patients received bailout stenting and that they excluded heavy calcification. So if we look at Viabon in general, sort of uh, from 30,000 uh, feet above uh, from the ground, you can see that in a lot of the meta-analyses that have been done so far, that the primary patency rates with stent grafting are really quite good. And, and one of the most important characteristics of stent grafts, of course, uh, as apropos in, in that last case that we just saw, is the fact that primary patency is independent of um, lesion length. And that's really important for these longer lesions. The VIPER trial was uh, to evaluate the performance of the new heparin-coated uh, device with the proximal contoured edge. Uh, I was uh, honored enough to be one of the investigators for this uh, study, results of which were published earlier this year in JVIR. Uh, the newer device, as you know, has the propatent bioactive surface with a proximal contoured edge, and it really f is felt to be a significant advance in that if you look at this uh, slide on the bottom, you can see with the older devices how the, 
the device is kind of all scrunched up at the top, so really would come as no surprise that there'd be a higher likelihood of developing a proximal edge stenosis. But look how nicely, um, with the trimming of that proximal material, you see a much nicer and smoother transition uh, between the stent graft and the native artery. And it's important to remember that this device was not available in the Vibrant trial. If we look at the lesion characteristics, again, much more of a real world scenario here, folks. You got an average lesion length of 19 centimeters, over 50% of them were occluded, and moderate to severe calcification in 61%. And if we look at the primary patency overall, it was 74%. But if we look at the primary patency as a function of whether or not the stent graft was oversized, then some uh, interesting details begin to emerge, namely that if the operator was careful in sizing the stent graft and, and uh, made sure that he did not or she did not oversize it by more than 20%, then you were rewarded with an 88% primary patency on the proximal edge, 87% on the distal edge. And importantly, the five millimeter device seemed to perform as well as the larger diameter devices. This hadn't really been the case in some of the older literature uh, with the older design. And again, this theme comes back once, once more that uh, primary patency is independent of lesion length. So with that by way of introduction, let me uh, uh, talk to you about the Viastar uh, study. And I have to give core credit, they put their money where their mouth is and, and after the results of Vibrant, they uh, dusted themselves off and came up with Viastar, which is a randomized clinical trial of uh, the new generation stent graft device versus bare metal stents. This was uh, conducted in Europe. And if you look at the lesional characteristics, they're, they're, they're pretty uh, um, challenging. You've got an average of 19 centimeter lesion length in the Viabond group. Uh, CTOs in nearly 80% and almost three quarters of the lesions were task C and D. Yet if we look at the outcomes we can see a dramatic difference in performance between the bare nitinol stents and the stent graft. Overall difference was 54% versus 78% but here's the really uh, intriguing part of this analysis and I think um, this is really why those of us who who enjoy uh, the utility of stent grass for long lesions, why we're so at, um, uh, excited about this newer device. You have a 33% primary patency in the bare metal group versus 73% uh, in the stent graft group, I would, uh, in those lesions that are more than 20 centimeters. I think you have to agree that's a pretty dramatic difference. So where do Viastar and Viper fit in this total schema of a lot of the trials that have been presented and published to date? Well, I think, again, it just uh, uh, proves the old adage that uh, increasing lesion length usually with bare metal stents results in a drop-off of primary patency. But again, we can see that with these very long, challenging subsets, we have excellent primary patency with the uh, new generation stent graft. Well, what about instant restenosis and fractures? There's no doubt that uh, this is the Achilles heel uh, of stenting. We know from a paper from Dr. Shiner's group a number of years ago that there was a correlation between uh, stent fracture and reduction in primary patency. Uh, if we look at a contemporary series of patients treated for restenosis, this is a paper from John Laird's group in Sacramento, you can see that using a variety of techniques, bottom line here was that at the end of one year with the mean ISR lesion length of over 13, the primary patency rate was only about 48%. Uh, this is an interesting uh, paper from Italy looking at drug coated balloon for fempop restenosis, uh, where they had an average lesion length of 83 millimeters and a very impressive primary patency rate of 92%. Obviously we'll have to try to see and make sure that this data is reproduced from other centers. Well what about using a Zilver PTX drug looting stent to treat bare metal nitinol restenosis. This was actually um, a paper that Dr. Zeller and colleagues published uh, primarily from Europe, and they had an average lesion length of 133 millime millimeters, and you can see the primary patency rate was about 78%, but with a 40% um, uh, outcome with regards to uh, TLR. So it makes sense that a covered stent might be an attractive way for dealing with this problem. In looking at our uh, data from Boston, uh, we had 27 uh, patients with an average lesion length of 24 centimeters, 
about a third were treated with laser, two thirds with cutting balloon angioplasty, and importantly, 25% of them were treated with inflow intervention, and nearly 40% we performed outflow intervention. I think um, that extra effort was worth it because we were rewarded with a primary patency rate of 85% at one year and 81% at three year with a 96% three year secondary patency rate. The Reline trial is a randomized trial of the new generation covered stent versus PTA for ISR. Uh, this was recently completed in Europe and the six-month data were presented, and basically a very, very uh, significant divergence of, of treatment uh, outcomes at six months, 95% primary patency rate in the stent graft group versus 60% in the PTA group. I'll finish with one uh, patient. This was a 62-year-old gentleman who came in with unstable angina, had a circumflex PCI, couldn't do cardiac rehab, had bilateral SFA occlusions, and so we treated this with uh, bare night and all stents got a very nice result. But unfortunately, over the course of the next two years, he presented for three additional interventions using a variety of techniques, including cutting balloon, cryoplasty, laser. And then finally, we said, well, gee, let's try a stent graft. And here you can see proliferative restenosis. Uh, and just with cutting balloon and Viabon stenting, a very nice angiographic result. But here's the bottom line. In seven years, he has been completely asymptomatic and uh, has had no recurrent uh, evidence of restenosis. So in conclusion, um, the newer uh, covered stent graft device certainly exhibits excellent patency in long SFA lesions. Again, uh, patency being independent of lesion length. It's very satisfying to see that the smaller five millimeter device seems to be performing as well as the other devices. These stent grafts are safe with very low rates of stent thrombosis in acute limb ischemia. And uh, as we'll see here in just a minute, uh, these are really uh, quite easy to treat with power pulse spray and or ultrasound assisted thrombolysis. Technique is obviously critically important. You have to do this right. You can't just bang in a six by 15 uh, Viabon and expect to have a good outcome. It really have to go from healthy to healthy and make sure um, that uh, the proximal edge is not oversized. And uh, certainly Viper confirmed improved patency with the new device, and now with Viastar we have definitive uh, uh, level one evidence that for these long SFA lesion stent grafts uh, are superior to bare nitinol stents for treatment of these uh, long SFA lesions. And I apologize for going over, but thank you. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and go back to Dr. Matarjame. Um, uh, while we're transitioning over, a quick question, Dr. Sukas. Um, when you do have these, ins uh, these stents that are occluded and they have new intimal hyperplasia, do you always do some type of atherectomy first and before you place a stent graft, uh, or do you just go straight with the stent graft? I have to confess our bias has usually been to do some type of um, atherectomy debulking. But um, interestingly, when we went back and looked at our own data, uh, we did uh, debulking in about 36% uh, of those patients. And, and when we compared them to those where we just did a cutting balloon and just put in stent grafts, there actually was no difference in the outcomes. Hmm. So uh, it intrinsically makes sense and common sense would suggest, gee, it might be nice to debulk that to make room for the stent. Uh, at least in our small series, it, it wasn't uh, something that had to be or was mandatory. Um, how are we doing the live case? All right, Dr. Matarjay, you're back online with us. Uh, yeah. Can you see me now? We sure can. You're back online, and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, while we were off uh, screen, we went and did uh, uh, silver hog atherectomy. Uh, which, uh, which device did you use? This, uh, we use LSM, uh, the short one. And uh, can you uh, show them that atheroma? Uh, this is what we, we got out. And how many, could you kind of just go through the process as we missed that? How many passes did you use? Um, how many cuts? Oh, I, I, I uh, met uh, made uh, passes until the nose cone was full. And one insertion only, maybe we went 
up and down four times. Mm -hmm. And this is what we got out. You see and, some thrombus uh, as well as plaque in there. There's a little thrombus uh, removed as well. Correct, well. correct, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is the angiogram. Can you show the screen now? Tell, tell me if you see the angiogram. Yes, we do. Pull, pull it up. Okay, this is post atherectomy. And so we're going to we measure the length of, you know, all the uh, residual stenosis and a little bit above and below that. We came to about seven point something centimeter. Uh, artery measured close to six. So we got a six uh, by 80 millimeter balloon. And uh, no, Angel? Okay. Here is our balloon coming down. So while you're working there, Dr. Matarjman, I'm going to poll our panel to see how the rest of our panel would have treated this lesion. Would you guys have gone directly to angioplasty? Would you do angioplasty stenting? Would you use, I know Dr. Miller said, you know, jet stream, he would like that in, in this area. Dr. Hussein, what do you think? How would you have treated this? Um, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty no, focal lesion um, from what I remember. And, and when I saw the uh, initial angiogram, I probably would have just used a focal balloon angioplasty catheter initially and just see what kind of result I get. Would you use a, a plaque modification angioplasty balloon, like an angiosculpt or a chocolate balloon, or would you just use a, balloon, a plain, plain old balloon, POVA? I'd probably just do POVA. Okay. What about the rest of our panel? Yeah, I, I think that um, I probably would have employed a similar strategy of doing a, some plaque excision atherectomy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was a decent amount of calcium yes, there, exactly. so I have to confess I probably would have splurged and used an angioscore just to try to uh, optimize the uh, expansion of the lesion uh, and potentially even avoid the possibility of having to put a stent in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly if there was any significant recoil after a scoring balloon would obviously have a low threshold for implanting a stent. You already have the IVUS out. You could, uh, instead of ballooning at this point, you could have IVUS to look at the lesion and see, you know, whether you want to go back for another pass with the uh, Silverhawk yeah. first. All right. Well, so I'm up, sure okay. if you go back with the Silverhawk, you will get more, you excise more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and, think so. You know, going right off the bat with the balloon is okay if you were committed to put in a stent in, there would be no chance whatsoever that you can a ugly looking lesion like that and cal partially calcified, you can do a balloon dilatation and stop right there. It, it just doesn't work that way. So if you are ready to do a balloon dilatation and put a stent in, I would say it would have been okay not to do a thoracotomy. The only chance you have to do balloon dilatation only is if you debulk them first. If you debulk them, then you do a balloon dilatation, it's possible that you don't have to stent them. But if you go with the balloon, I don't care what type of the balloon. Balloon is balloon. Now, you get a little bit uh, fancier with a little bit uh, a wire or you get flavored like a chocolate balloon and it still is balloon. It, it still is dilatation. It still is disruption of the intima. And so if you balloon them first, you have to be ready to put the stent in, which is, you know, nothing wrong. With, we still may end up putting the stent in. But if you're thinking about maybe doing without the stent, I think you'll have to debulk them first. You know, uh, in my experience, um, even if I see a little bit of calcium, I'm more inclined to use the calcium cutter just because I've had certain times where, you know, I've sort of regretted not having the more powerful cutting uh, uh, of a, a calcium, and, uh, like an LSC. Uh, but obviously this worked very nicely for you, but um, I usually have a very well, low threshold uh, to go to a calcium seen, cutter. Yeah, just seeing the calcium, especially in the arterial wall, it really doesn't call for uh, using a device like a CSI. 
if you see a chunk of calcium, intramural calcium, definitely. This is what we do all the time. Uh, but a lesion like that, I don't think CSI would have been enough. No, I was saying you actually have the... To excise the I was actually referring to the, um, the LSC turbohawk, the calcium cutter turbohawk. Oh, turbohawk, yeah, yeah. Oh, that looks really good. That's a nice result, Amir. Okay, let's see that. So what do you guys think? What does the panel think? Uh, would you leave this? Would you do anything else at this point? I think I'd probably re ivis it since you already have it out. And if it looks like you've got a great looking looming without any significant um, uh, flaps ivis. or dissections, it would, wouldn't be unreasonable to just leave it. Amir, what about an angiogram of that popliteal lesion now that you have good flow all the way through? Uh, we'll check it for you. We will. That's so nice. Hmm? There is a little bit clot there the too. I'd like to do the Randad angioscope one more time down there. And, but we're going to look at it with the IVUS now to see uh, what type of the uh, intimal integrity we have there. Now, Amir, uh, and, uh, while we're loading up the IVUS, I want to ask you a question about distal protection. Do you use distal protection in all your CTOs and all your atherectomy? What's your, uh, your mindset using distal protection in, uh, in these lesions? Uh, Jafar, I use uh, distal protection in every single atherectomy case I do. Uh, and also when I do NG jet and thrombectomy. I use uh, distal protection as well. And uh, I and maybe underestimated the size of this artery. I used a five millimeter uh, distal protection. And we probably could have used six, but I think five is probably enough because his popliteal wasn't very large. And uh, okay, here is the iris. Go ahead. Can, are you seeing that? Can you hold this wire? Here we go. See, we still have some, we have some arthromos there. Is that the distal lesion or is that, where, is, where are you here? Uh, that's where, exactly where the lesion. Okay here on the floral. That's where the lesion starts. So with that finding, what we, how would you treat that? Are you gonna go ahead and proceed with the stent or leave that? I, I, I think I'll, 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 I'll put a stent just about uh, maybe a 10 uh, centimeter long stent. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Amir. We're gonna go ahead and break away, and uh, thank you very much for okay. a, a very interesting case and a great example of using thrombolysis to clear a, a long SFA CTO, followed by atherectomy, balloon angioplasty, and stenting. Thank you very much. We'll see you back in a little bit. You're welcome. Bye. So I think we can maybe do one more talk before we break for lunch. You want? Uh, the uh, DIY step-by-step -step pulse spray. Yeah, that's on the laptop. So um, before we uh, break for lunch, um, this is, I think, uh, I wanted to do this before we break just because on the heels of Dr. Sukas's talk about um, uh, Viabon stenting and we've, had, we've seen some great, great um, data uh, both the Viastar Viper and Dr. Sukas' um, uh, data on the Vibon stenting. But, uh, you know, these uh, covered stents will thrombose, and that's just a fact of life. Uh, just like uh, bare metal stents will uh, occlude. It's just going to happen. And so you really have to be aware of this and know how to treat these patients appropriately. So this is going to be a, a talk that I wanted to go through, just a very practical approach to how to do uh, thrombolysis of covered stents in 30 minutes using power pulse technique. 
So as I mentioned before, these are, and Dr. Uh, Sukas has mentioned as well, these are great devices for, uh, uh, for long SFA occlusions. They're very good for sealing uh, popliteal aneurysms, perforations, and the unique thing about this, uh, the Viabon is that the patency is really not related to the length of lesion. So you can have a 300 millimeter lesion, you can have a 20 millimeter lesion, your patency is not affected as much. Um, and obviously appropriate sizing is very important, as Dr. Sukas had mentioned, and covering all uh, areas of the disease. And aggressive surveillance, because you'd rather catch these patients before they occlude off rather than, uh, uh, than uh, see the, them you know, a year after they occlude their, their, disease, uh, their stent. So as I mentioned before, graft occlusions will occur. You just have to be comfortable with it and know how to treat these patients. The way these grafts fail is just like a fempop. That's how you have to think of uh, covered stents or Viabon stents is just like a fempop bypass. So usually there's a mechanical obstruction proximally or distally, and then the rest, uh, uh, gets, uh, the rest of the uh, stent gets filled with thrombus, and that's how they occlude. Uh, and obviously the symptoms of occlusion, uh, they usually occlude uh, acutely, but sometimes they acute chronically. Uh, if they have uh, enough collaterals um, uh, in place. So there are several different options to treat these patients. You can use thrombolytic therapy overnight. You can use laser thrombectomy. You could use e ECOS in adjunction to thrombolytic therapy. I usually uh, use distal protection in all of these patients because they have a very heavy thrombus burden. Uh, the, the problem with overnight thrombolytic therapy is uh, you have some systemic absorption and you have uh, some inconvenience to your patient as well. You have to put these patients in the intensive care unit, thrombolytic therapy overnight, as Dr. Uh, Amir had noted with his patient, patient developed a hematoma, they had to stop it, so it's inconsistent in terms of delivering the thrombolysis. And so what I like to do is I like to use the power pulse technique to deliver a localized thrombolytic therapy in the uh, covered stent and uh, treat these patients in that matter. Now, when you use power pulse, what happens is you're actually delivering uh, a thrombolytic therapy within the plaque itself at about two to three PSIs. This softens the thrombus, making the thrombus more amenable to extraction with angiojet. After that, you're gonna go ahead and go in with your angiojet uh, and extract the thrombus, and this will really, uh, reveal the proximal or distal occlusion. So how do we do this? So obviously you have a seven French crossover sheath in place. It, these lesions are usually very easy to cross because they're very focal lesions, either proximally or distally, and the rest is just thrombus, and you know that. So usually just using a glide wire and glide catheter, very, very easy to cross these lesions. Make sure you confirm you're in the true lumen with the distal injection, and then at that point I usually put in my uh, filter. I use the six French Expedior catheter with power pulse option. You have to make sure you have that catheter in place. And you know, I, I initially when I started doing this, I used a 10 milligram of TPA and 50 cc's. And then we started looking at a lower dose of TPA. Uh, and now our convention is to use uh, a much lower dose, five milligrams of TPA and 50 cc's. And this is usually sufficient. And if it's not, you can always go back with another five milligrams of TPA and 50 cc's. I put it in 50 cc's because you really want this concentrated, so you don't want it in a 100 cc bag or you know 200 cc bag, you want the TPA really concentrated so you're able to deliver it. So the next thing is you have to set the device in power pulse mode, and um, this is what it looks like, and there's just a little setting there. Make sure, as I mentioned before, that it's a power pulse enabled device. Uh, and you set it in your power pulse mode, and uh, you have the TPA bag there. So usually what you're gonna do is you're gonna prime the device first with just uh, regular uh, heparinized saline. And then once you're ready to go in, you switch, the, your nurse will switch the, uh, the catheter and put it into uh, the IV and put it into the TPA. And uh, this was actually uh, a picture that was taken a long time ago when we were still using 10 milligrams. <clears throat> Once you do this, I do, uh, once you're ready to go, I go with a single pass down the, uh, down the lesion, down the covered stent, and then a pass on the way out. And during the whole time, um, my nurses are telling me exactly how much uh, TPA I'm delivering because I want to deliver my 50 cc's, being aware of the fact that we probably have about 10 to 20 cc's of, uh, of fluid uh, within the IV tubing. Uh, we want to deliver that full amount uh, within uh, one, uh, one pass in and one pass out. Uh, 
So here's an example of this. So this is a, a patient that had a Viabond stent graft that had occluded. And this patient had actually um, occluded several months before. Um, she just never came back to see me. She never came for follow-up. She states that she had started having claudication several months ago and, uh, and, and um, just thought it would, it would go away on its own. So as you can see here, there is a, a occlusion on the Viabond stent and it came back uh, distally in the distal popliteal artery. And this is after uh, power pulse. This is uh, one pass in, one pass out. You let the, uh, let the thrombus marinate for about 20 minutes. That's all you need, about 20 minutes. And then you come back and perform angiojet. Um, and one pass in, one pass out of angiojet. That's really all you need. And then now you see the osteal lesion. And this is what you need to know, is where is the mechanical obstruction that caused the Vibon to go down? That's what you need to know. And so you can see there's an osteal lesion as well as a distal lesion in the popliteal artery. And that was then stented with, uh, 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 the, the Viabon was then extended right into the osteum with another short Viabon, as well as distally into the popliteal artery with another Viabon with excellent results. So uh, I didn't want to go into uh, too much of the post-op because this is more of a, a technique-based uh, uh, talk on delivering the, uh, the power pulse and how to use that for CTOs. So as I mentioned before, stent grafts, great, great options for long SFA occlusions, but you really need to know how to treat these patients when they occlude. And, you know, some of my colleagues uh, and, you know, some other physicians that have used this, you know, they get very afraid of these patients or are, are rushing them emergently to the operating room. That really doesn't have to be done. If you know how to treat these patients, you know that there's either proximal or, or distal occlusion, uh, make sure you get rid of the thrombus. Very simple technique with power pulse. Uh, within you know, 30 minutes, you can treat these patients very nicely without having to uh, put them in the ICU overnight and without having to uh, have the complications of overnight thrombolytic therapy. Um, and then you really have to think about what else you can do to help prevent this from happening. So I know we discussed before maybe antiplatelet or uh, platelet reactivity testing, uh, considering anticoagulation such as um, Xeralto or Coumadin long term. And very, 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 very important is routine surveillance. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of patients get lost to follow up. Sometimes our patients are, are non compliant, as you can imagine. But um, fixing these problems in these patients before they actually occlude is obviously much easier than fixing them once they uh, completely occluded. Thank you. So I think at this time we can go ahead and break for lunch and um, if you want to go ahead and grab some lunch and come back and we'll go ahead and uh, start our lunch symposium.